Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Mary Jo Bain, Professor of Public Policy here at the Kennedy School. Uh, it's my honor and pleasure this afternoon to introduce and to welcome to the Kennedy School the senior senator from Minnesota, Paul Wellstone. Paul Wellstone was first elected to the Senate in 1990. Before that, he had been a political science professor at Carleton College for 21 years an example of the movement from academia into politics wildly successfully. As a senator, Senator Wellstone serves on the Labor and Human Resources Committee, the Foreign Relations Committee, the Small Business Committee, the Indian Affairs Committee, and labor subcommittees on aging, children and families, education, and veterans affairs. He has a long list of legislative accomplishments legislative accomplishments in the area of government reform and lobbying reform, in education, in agriculture, in domestic violence, health care, energy and the environment, and veterans issues. Senator Wellstone cares passionately about the poor, about children, and about vulnerable citizens in the society. He so showed that in, in so many ways. In my personal experience, when I was in Washington, I often had the what seemed at the time the dubious honor uh, of testifying before committees on which uh, the senator served. And I often had the experience of, of the senator really calling me and the, and the administration to task for not doing enough, for not working hard enough, for not caring enough. He really was our conscience. And then last summer, Senator Wellstone was the only senator who was up for reelection who cast a vote against the welfare bill, the bill that the president eventually signed, but that <laughs> but that this senator felt that, although it might hurt him in his elections, felt was the wrong thing to do. He won his reelection anyway, uh, despite his vote on the welfare bill, and despite, <laughs> well, we hope so, um, despite the attacks that were made on him. And I think, I, I think, in, in looking at that, what we can say is that the senator won his race because he had worked hard for the working people of Minnesota, because he had those accomplishments to, to boost up, and because even perhaps when the citizens of Minnesota didn't agree with every vote, as they might not have on the welfare bill, they knew that Senator Wellstone stood for principle and told the truth. The senator is here with us this afternoon to tell the truth about race, poverty, and gender in America. We look forward to hearing him and are delighted to have him with us. Senator Wellstone. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let me thank the Institute of Politics and the Malcolm Weiner Center for Social Policy uh, for the invitation. And before I get a chance to talk about uh, Mary Jo Bain, let me also thank uh, all of you for being here. Um, Sheila and I are really pleased to be here. I'm here with my wife, Sheila. Uh, we do a lot of this work together. Um, and I'm really gratified that at 4 o'clock on Friday on a rainy day, not too cold by Minnesota standards, um, you are here. Thank you very much. It means, it means a great deal to us. Um, I, Mary Jo, was very uh, gracious in her introduction. I would like to say, and I promise you that I'm not going to just spend hours and hours talking about individual people, but I do need to shout it from the mountaintop here that if you want to talk about intellectual integrity and you want to talk about courage, then you have to talk about David Elwood, who worked on what was a real reform bill but would not go along with a welfare bill, which he felt was profoundly mistaken for our country. And you have to talk about Mary Jo Bain, and you have to talk about Peter Edelman, and we should give them a hand. I also want to tell you guys, if I say you guys, please understand in the Midwest that is men and women. Uh, I, 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 you know, it's just the way we say it. Um, I want to tell you also that for me, this is a bit of an experiment in one sense. I, when I was teaching, 
uh, never used written text. Uh, I just didn't feel like I could really, Doris, teach that well without having a chance to read people's faces. Um, and I never have really used written text, but I have worked very hard on this speech. Um, I want to make sure I say it the right way. Uh, Peter Edelman, who is a very good friend, helped me uh, work on this. And uh, it, it really means a, a lot uh, to me that, that you're here, and I want to try and do it the right way. I also uh, had another friend, Dick Goodwin, who helped me on it. So I'm going to do this differently. I'm going to use some written text, but I'm going to try and make it come alive because I care about this, and you do as well because you're here. I'm honored by your invitation, and I'm especially pleased because I want to talk to you about a matter that was of great concern to President Kennedy and was of defining urgency for his brother, Robert. The unacceptable level of poverty that still exists in the midst of enormous wealth of this great country. And I say great country because I do indeed love our country dearly. As we turn our thoughts to the next century, we can celebrate a great deal. The past hundred years have seen massive improvements in the quality of American life. American leadership in getting the world past murderous global conflict and successful transcendence of economic crisis. Our populations more diverse than ever, and at mid-century we dismantled the legal framework encasing our original sin of state-sanctioned racism. We are in many varied ways a model for much of the world. But there's at least one way in which we're not a model, one area in which we have in recent times been moving in the wrong direction. That is in fulfilling our national vow of equal opportunity. We said in 1776 that every American should have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In 1997, that national commitment is in need of refurbishing and renewal. More than 35 million Americans, one out of every seven of our fellow citizens, are officially poor. More than one in five American children, really closer to one out of four American children, are poor. One out of every two children of color are poor. And the poor are getting poor. In 1994, of the poor children under the age of six, nearly half lived in families with incomes below half the poverty line. That figure has doubled over the last 20 years, and the number of people who work full time and still are poor has risen dramatically as well. Let me just say, as a grandfather and a father, it is also unfortunately true that about every 30 seconds a child is born into poverty in our country. It is also true that about every two minutes a child is born to a mother who had no prenatal care, and when children are born severely underweight, they may never have a chance to reach his or her full potential. This is not what the country is about, and we can do better. Poor people are increasingly hemmed into poor neighborhoods. With everything that means in terms of poor schools, crime, violence, lack of accessible jobs, and all the rest, minorities, are poorer than the rest of Americans. African Americans at 29.3% in 1995, and Hispanics at 30.3%. Female-headed households are even poorer. 44.6% of the children who lived in such families were poor in 1994, and almost half of all children who are poor live in female-headed households. We cannot turn our gaze away from the convergence of race and gender and poverty and children in America. What does it mean to be poor in America? We can offer no single description of American poverty. But for many, perhaps most, it means homes with peeling paint, inadequate heating, uncertain plumbing. It means that only the very lucky among the children receive a decent education. It often means a home where some go to bed hungry and malnutrition is a frequent visitor. It means that the most elementary components of the good life in America, a vacation with kids, an evening out, a comfortable home, are but distant and unreachable dreams more likely to be seen on the television set 
than in the neighborhood. And for almost all the poor, all 35 million, it means a life that is a constant struggle to obtain the merest necessities of existence, those things most of us take for granted, we can do better as a nation. It's an old saw that the rich get richer and the poor get poor. For nearly two decades, that cliche has been a painful fact. Nearly all of America's growth has benefited the wealthiest among us. From 1977 to 1992, the richest 1% of Americans gained 91% in after-tax income, while the poorest fifth actually lost 17% of their income. The top 1%'s total income equals that of the entire bottom two-fifths of the population, and with wealth, it would be an even more distorted pattern. Why? Why the poverty? One view is that it's their fault. We have had too much welfare for too long, and they, I put the they in quotes, have become dependent on welfare, and they don't get off the couch and go out and get a job. We have just had a major national debate on this whole subject, and the proponents of the blame the welfare, blame the welfare recipients, and blame the poor view one for now. But there's another view, and it happens to be the one that fits the facts. That view is that there are some fundamental problems in our American economy, some fundamental problems posed by the widening gap between the rich and poor in this nation, and some fundamental problems in the way we view women and the way we view minorities. I will be the first to say that adults in our society need to take responsibility for themselves if they possibly can. Personal responsibility is a part of my values. I'm quite sure it's a part of your values. And I think it should be a part of everyone's values. I will be the first to say that there's some basic issues about values that we need to confront, like our glorification of violence. But until we come to a real understanding of the structural problems in our economy and our society that are getting in our way, we will continue to legislate by bumper stickers and by slogans. We need to have a national, an honest national conversation, and an honest conversation in every community about what is really going on, about why we face the unacceptable level of poverty and near poverty, and about what we're going to do about it. We must not let the current debate over welfare or the role of government be used to mask the grim realities of American poverty. Most poor people are not poor by choice. Most would prefer to work for a decent wage. Nor can we offer justification for the children who were born into a poverty that they did not choose or deserve and whose conditions prevent them from gaining the skills and ambitions which would allow them to escape. I've come here to make a commitment I'm going to do everything I can to start that national conversation. I'm going to travel the length and the breadth of this country as Robert Kennedy did 30 years ago and as Eleanor Roosevelt did during the Depression to observe the face of American poverty, not from behind a Senate desk, but in the streets and the villages and the neighborhoods of those who were in distress. And hopefully I can also help to dramatize their plight and to reveal for many of our fellow citizens the face of poverty as it exists at the end of the millennium. And I want to share with our nation not only the problems as they really exist, but some of the wonderful, promising, exciting things that people are doing in communities to tackle those problems. And I have to say today, if it's not obvious, I do not know all the answers. I am not arrogant. I do not know most of the answers. No one does. And if your professors tell you that they know all the answers, run the other way. These are hard, tough issues. We have to work on them in an open and honest way. Poverty has many faces. There are the elderly now less poor than the rest of America because of the success of Social Security and Medicare and the Supplementary Security Income Program and the pension system. But women and minorities among the elderly are disproportionately poor, and our challenge for the elderly is to find the right way to protect Social Security and preserve Medicare. 
There are the disabled, protected by the historic Americans for Disabilities Act, but experiencing a backlash in recent benefit cuts, and for those who are employable, still unemployed at very high rates. There are dislocated workers forced out of jobs by downsizing and plant relocation. There are women and children made poor by divorce or abandonment. There are the rural poor who live far from available work and farmers who work as hard as anyone could and can't make ends meet. I will visit all of these and help to tell their stories. Their problems are real and pressing and we're not doing enough about them. But there are four groups, four overlapping groups, whom I particularly want to discuss today. Groups who tend even more to set off the bumper sticker talk and the political hot buttons and the simple-minded solutions. H.L. Mencken once said, for every problem, there's a solution that's neat and simple and wrong. These groups are the working poor, welfare recipients, inner city and rural poor, and poor children and youth. Our left hand does not know what our right hand is doing. Think about those numbers I cited a moment ago about entry-level wages. We recite the mantra of good jobs being replaced by lousy jobs until our minds are numb. How many times have we heard from Bob Reich and many others the numbers about the rich getting richer and the poor getting poor, literally losing real income? There are real people behind these numbers, literally millions of people and more every day who are working as hard as they can and still are poor. And if we had a more honest measure of poverty, the numbers would be even higher. We know the answer so well that we recite it as a bumper sticker, make work pay. But talk is cheap, and bumper sticker slogans are a particularly cheap form of talk. We're a day late and dollars short in doing what we should be doing to help. If there's any group of deserving poor in the United States, although that is a term I greatly dislike, it is the working poor. We have raised the earned income tax credit substantially. That is good. We now have raised the minimum wage a little. That is good. But both are still too low. And we look the other way when the question is whether the lousy jobs that too many Americans have carry health care coverage. We do a little shuffle when the real cost of child care is mentioned. And a small calculation on the back of an envelope would reveal that the parents with the lousy jobs can't afford the child care, especially if it is only one parent with one lousy job. And now we're about to flood the labor market with a new supply of low-wage workers. Out there, pushed out there by the bumper sticker command of our new welfare law to find a job, any job. The vast majority of them are women who still earn less than men and minority women at that who learn less than white women. So these new workers are especially likely to end up with low wage jobs. And elementary labor economics says they are, if anything, going to depress those wages further for everyone at the low wage end of the labor market. Simply put, there are not enough jobs available that are geographically accessible and sufficiently undemanding of technical skills for all the long-term welfare recipients who have now been told to enter the labor market or else. In real life, people of color will encounter discrimination when they try to find a job. But for a huge proportion of those who do find work, there will be a different and very serious issue. How do I make ends meet? To add to that problem, in the same welfare bill, there are large food stamp cuts that by 2002 will reduce the benefits across the board by 20% for everyone, including the millions of working poor who get a little help from food stamps in their constant struggle to keep things together. The left hand does not want to ask what the right hand is doing. The problem of low wage work has been getting worse and worse for nearly 25 years. It's a problem of economics compounded by the problems of gender, the issues of gender and race discrimination that permeate our society. We need to talk about it and we need to act. If some people will leave welfare for low-wage jobs because they have to, even though they're going to end up worse off, 
Others will fall prey to the single worst aspect of the welfare bill, the arbitrary fall off the cliff five year limit for federally financed cash assistance, which can be even shorter if states choose and many of the states are so choosing. People can play by all the rules and do everything that's asked of them. And if they still come to the point after five years or intermittent spells of assistance totaling five years and have no job, they are out, out. The welfare law does allow 20% of the caseload to be exempted from the time limit. I'm sorry to say, Mary Jo, that I believe the number who do not find work or cannot go to work because they have a chronically ill child or relative to care for, or cannot go to work because they face violent retaliation from a husband or a boyfriend if they do, or who are functionally disabled is much higher than 20%. This approach is no answer. The answer is not ending welfare as we know it. It's not ending welfare by fiat. The answer is to deal honestly with the real causes of poverty. We have to do this by genuinely making work pay, living wage jobs, including health care and child care that go along with it. But we have to do it in two other fundamental ways as well. By committing ourselves to a genuine, positive, realistic developmental and educational strategy for children and young people so that they reach adulthood with the tools and the attitudes they need to be responsible, self-sufficient adult citizens. And by reclaiming our neighborhoods of endemic poverty and helping the parents and other decent people to create a healthy and safe environment in which to raise children and bring them along the road to responsible adulthood. These last challenges underscore the complexity of the tasks and the complexity of the list of those who have the responsibility if serious change is to occur. There's a lot of talk going around about devolution, another politicized oversimplification in my estimation. Most of those who talk devolution confine their reformism impulse to, handling, to handing control to the states and at bargain basement prices to boot. The governors who salivate for control are all too ready to strike Faustian bargains for control without the money to carry it off. I'm an enthusiast of devolution. I believe in decentralization. I'm a community organizer. I think people should be empowered at the neighborhood local level. But only so long as devolution is a term that is defined accurately and the recipients of the sharing of responsibility include people in neighborhoods, the nonprofits, and the mayors, and the county executives. Washington, D.C. is the only city I know when, when the governors come to town, everybody says, let's hear from the grassroots. It goes a little bit beyond that. <laughs> if we're going to be effective in assuring that the primary responsibility for children is where it belongs, which is with their parents, we have to stop and ask whether we're helping them to do their job or are we getting in their way. We have to get past this silly political debate about whether it takes a village or a family. The point is the idea of community is very real and critically important. It's far broader than government. It's far broader than any particular program. Families need help with income or services, but they also can use support in the arrangement of hours they work or the options that are afforded to them by their employee assistance plan. Schools that welcome parents and make themselves into neighborhood beacons by the hours they keep and their partnership with community organizations can be a great help to parents struggling to keep their children from succumbing to the pull of the street. We need to pay particular attention to young men. The welfare law focuses on women, although not exactly in a positive way. It focuses on men and its tough new provisions on child support. But we need to be promoting responsible fatherhood, and that means marriage and involvement with children and two earners in the family. One reason marriages do not form is lack of opportunity. Communities need to work on strategies to help young women and young men both to make it successfully into the job market. We have had a strategy for young men, but it's the wrong strategy. It's called prison. 
and it's eating its way through higher education budgets and school budgets across America. We will only stop feeding the correctional appetite if we stop supplying new customers. But if too many parents find it terribly hard to meet all their responsibilities, and too many young people are falling by the wayside, communities cannot do the job of helping all by themselves. We need government, and we need the federal government now, because there's some steps we can take as a nation, as a national community right now that would make an enormous difference in the lives of children. It is a scandal that 10 million children in America do not have basic health care to grow healthy and be ready to reach their full potential. It is a scandal that despite the irrefutable and irreducible evidence as a former teacher that the most important educational program of all is to make sure that every woman expecting a child has a diet rich in vitamin, mineral, and protein so that child at birth will have a chance to reach her full potential and his full potential, that we only currently fund the Women, Infant, and Children program, a dramatically successful program, at 60% of need. We know WIC works. We know it's good prevention. We know it gives children an opportunity. And we fund it at a 60% level. And it is a scandal that whereas the Head Start program has indeed done just what the Head Start program says it will do by title, give children from tough backgrounds, difficult circumstances, just that, a head start during those critical early years that we have yet to fully fund it. Currently, Head Start reaches only 17% of eligible three-year-olds and only 41% of four-year-olds. And I know, and Sheila knows, and some of you in here know, maybe many of you know, when we have our grandchildren visit with us, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. Two-year-old, same room, every 15 seconds, he finds something new and interesting. I don't, you don't, but he does. He's experiencing all of the unnamed magic of the world that is before him. This is a time to nurture these children. This is a time to support these children. This is the right thing to do. And we don't even fully fund Head Start. And I tell you, as a Democrat, I could explain it why Ronald Reagan, a Republican president, didn't propose to fully fund Head Start, and George Bush, a Republican president, would not fully fund Head Start. I can't explain why President Clinton, a Democrat, does not propose to fully fund Head Start. Just because the children are not the heavy hitters with the high-powered Washington lobbyists does not mean that the Congress and the President should remain silent. There's simply no excuse for not fully funding WIC and Head Start or ensuring basic health care for children and now. And as a United States Senator, I don't mean it in a bragging way, I mean it in a very quiet and sincere way. I intend to bring these issues to the floor and fight over and over and over again and force votes on every one of these questions. And I expect to win because there is goodness in this country and the vast majority of people believe that every child should have a chance. That is the goodness of America. That is the essence of the American dream. We also need federal financial support for many of the things people need to be empowered to do locally. There's a difference between federal funding, and let's not confuse this, and federal administration or even detailed federal regulation. Just as there is a difference between federal funding and the question of who carries out the activities with the public money. We have a large, vital, nonprofit sector in America, but it's able to do its work only because it receives considerable public funding. There are some who choose not to know this and somehow think the federal money can be removed without negative effect. That is the financial version of the Immaculate Conception. There are hundreds and thousands of marvelous initiatives occurring in so many ways all over this nation that are making a major difference in the lives of poor people. I know that I've been an organizer almost all my adult life, and I've worked in many of these communities. We do not lack ideas. We do not lack knowledge. 
We do not lack committed people, but we lack scale. We lack a national commitment. We lack the means and methodology to get the shoulders of enough Americans at the wheel to push our vehicle of opportunity out of the rut in which it has become stuck. We lack a genuine national debate over the real underlying questions, the way our economy is structured, the importance of creating living wage jobs, and the very real issues of race and gender that are so deeply infused in so much of what goes on in our country. Without such a debate, without enlisting the energies of our fellow citizens, these problems can never be resolved. I've spent enough time in Washington, and I've read enough history to know they will not be solved from the top. It was a combination of the civil rights movement and the activist movements of the 60s which generated our last truly national attack on the problems of poverty. That effort expired in the conflagration of Vietnam. But the successes of the civil rights activists, of the women's movement, of the peace movement, were a clear demonstration of the truism that in a democracy, significant social change comes from the bottom up, from an aroused opinion that forces our ruling institutions to do the right thing. I think we can do better. That's what Robert Kennedy always said. Can't you hear him with that Northeastern accent, if I did that OK? I think we can do better. I think we can. I think we must. Robert Kennedy was fond of a quote from Albert Camus that we could use to start our journey today. Perhaps we cannot make this a world in which children are no longer tortured, Camus said, but at least we can reduce the number of tortured children. Won't you join me in that effort? Thank you. has agreed to answer questions. There is a microphone on each side, and I know it'll be a little bit complicated to get to the microphones, but try. Uh, and we'll just take questions in order from the people at the microphones until it's time to stop. So it's all yours. No, absolutely. Please. Um, is my memory correct in thinking that Clinton in the 1992 campaign promised to fully fund Head Start? Uh, I think your memory is correct. Uh, could, would you care to comment on four years of uh, ignoring that campaign promise? Um, well, and can I get everybody's name and just a kind of sense of, of what you do here? Just so I. Oh, uh, Reg McKean, Harvard Institute for Learning and Retirement. Thanks, Sir Reg. Um, well, you are correct, and I, I mean I appreciate the the hard hitting question, and. I don't feel like it's too directed at me. Um, I, I think, but, but what I want to do is, rather than kind of castigate the president, what I think I want to say is, yes, it made a commitment, and um, we aren't coming anywhere close to fully funding Head Start, and we're not going to see that in the budget proposal um, that's going to be week. coming. Yeah, no, not at all. But in a way, that becomes our challenge. Um, and I, it's interesting, the other day in our caucus, and I was very pleased, and I, and I um, said, look, you know, I don't understand how we can possibly justify not doing this. And there were a number of people, I mean a large number of people, who said they wanted to co-sponsor an amendment and bring it out to the floor and force the vote and just keep and become much more public and much stronger about this. Um, at least in the Senate, and I think that, and, and that was a great response. The interesting thing is I think you're going to have all sorts of people trying to race ahead of one another to bring an amendment out, whereas I think we all ought to do it together. So the answer is no. The, I mean, the, the President made that commitment. It has, that's a commitment he's not followed through on. I think what has happened is the focus has been on deficit reduction, and that therefore has essentially um, trumped 
some of, uh, of the initiatives that the President had originally uh, talked about. The interesting thing also about the deficit reduction is that Bob Greenstein has done just excellent work. What is it, the Center on, uh, budget and Center on Budget and Policy Priorities? And, and what Bob has pointed out and others is that if you look at, at what happened last year with deficit reduction, it's sort of based upon, now I go to my own analysis, the path of least political resistance. So the other problem is that too, too many of the cuts we're focused on the most vulnerable people who have the least amount of political clout. But I think that the best bet is to always uh, call on people in America to be their own best selves, and I think we should fight it out on Head Start in the Senate and in the Congress, and, and I'm convinced that we can win. When was the last Senate um, roll, call, um, roll call on this issue? Uh, I'm very glad you're going to try and get the senators committed on these issues uh, so they can, when, the when they face the voters in 98, that's right. Yeah. That's exactly the point. I don't know when we had a separate vote on, on Medicare. I mean, I'm sorry, on Head Start, I can't remember, but we will. And the th interesting thing is, and I don't even mean this in a, I don't want to come off the wrong way. You know, you have to have a twinkle in your eye, but of course I take it very seriously. I probably will have many votes on Head Start, not just one. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, Senator. Uh, my name is Will Monahan. I'm a student at the college. I'm also a reporter for the Harvard Crimson covering this today. I wanted to ask you, this is maybe a bit off target, about uh, Chairman Greenspan's remarks yesterday about the CPI and how you feel about that. Should it be changed? What, what, in general, what's your reaction? Well, in, in general, my reaction is um, that I think it's a, I mean, I'll, I'll wait to see what the Bureau of Labor Statistics has to say. Um, I, I, on face value, I think it's a, it's a dubious proposition um, if you don't take into account the income effects. I mean, if you do it across the board, the question becomes, you know, what is it affect, what is it, its effect on the low income senior citizens and on other, on, on other such citizens. So I'm not, I know what Chairman Green, I know what he, he has said, uh, I know the sort of position he has taken. But it's, it's, it's fairly easy to, to be talking about these kind of proposals when you're not living on the edge and where it might not make a real difference to you or your children, and we have to be pretty careful about what the income effects of this are going to be. See, I, I tend to be, there are places where I'm willing to be a real hawk on, a deficit hawk, if you will, on expenditures. For example, in the Medicare uh, debate, I think it is absolutely a terrible idea, a terrible idea. Medicare has been a wee-wee program. It's a social insurance program. It's, we're all in the same boat, and Social Security. I don't want us to move away from that. It's a terrible mistake. Some people, that's their agenda. Privatize it, move away from it. I think that's a terrible mistake. That has very little to do with, the, with contracts that have made this a much better country. On the other hand, if you want to say to me, hey, are there some places where you could really cut expenditures? especially if you look at some of the reimbursement to some of the managed care plans in some parts of the country and some of the hospitals and some of the providers? Absolutely. It's a question of where you make the cuts. I, this across-the-board proposal, I think it's easy for Chairman Greenspan to make that proposal, but I'm real concerned about its effect on some of the citizens we're talking about. Yeah. Good afternoon, Senator. Thanks for coming here. My name is Joe Ragazzo, and um, I'm a student here at the Kennedy School. And I, I just have a general question. After the 94 elections, many of the pundits said that the era of the liberal wing of the Democratic Party was over. In fact, they predicted your death in 96. Uh, and in fact, your opponent. Sounds serious. <laughs> in fact, your opponent, if I recollect, um, called you foolishly liberal throughout the campaign in 96, and you yeah. beat him handily. What advice could you give to uh, those of us here? who wish to enter public service and uh, share your, your values. In a well, and, and by the way, I don't even think that the least the, the lecture today, to the best of my ability, I think was about kind of values and priorities of, you know, most of you here and most of the people in the country. It's not, you know, just a question of myself. Well, first of all, you know, I give a quick answer. I think, I think it's really important for you to I think it's a terrible thing when people get cynic. I don't think the cynics have ever changed the world for the better. I think it's important to, I think it's important to, to never be arrogant and try to even with, uh, what I've loved best about being in the Senate. I was a community organizer and I love that work and I was a teacher and I love that and I'll go back to it. But the one thing about the community organizing I used to do is I never had to run into that many people who had a very different view. I really, I have really liked being put in, in, in many, many situations where I, I meet with people who have a very different view. So I think it's real important to, 
to, to be appreciative and sensitive of the conditions that affect people's lives and, and, and why they think the way they think and what they're worried about and what they're frightened about and what they hope for and all of the rest. Um, I think it's real important for you to stay true to what you believe in, for whatever, and, and I, I, I'm sure you will. And if you're talking about elective office, because I don't know if you are, I mean, there are many ways that people can get involved in public service and act on what they believe in, and I'm not sure holding elective office is necessarily even the most important way to do it. But if that's in part what you're talking about, Joe, I think the lesson that I've learned, but I'm real lucky, I'm emotional about this. I've come off a tough race. Um, it, uh, embarrassing liberal or whatever you said was the, mod, the, 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 the sort of moderate, that was the kindest thing that was said uh, <laughs> during that race. Um, and, but what happened is, you know, I had, a, I had people in Minnesota really rallied to our side. I had the greatest campaign in the world, uh, not because of me, but because of the people that were involved. We had, uh, one of them, Sasha is here. Uh, Sasha Baltons is here, worked for this. Um, we had 850 house gatherings, uh, anywhere from 20 to, to 400 people showed up all across the state. We had, a, as my children would have said when they were younger, an awesome grassroots organization. And in the last week, during the waking hours of the day, we made 10,000 get out the vote calls every hour, all done by Minnesotans, all done in the state. Uh, we had a tremendous volunteer effort. We had a staff of about 35 or 40, about 95% of them were under 25, great organized. We out organized our opponents, the national attack crowd, the people in Minnesota. And finally, what people said to me, which I think is a lesson, and I apologize if this sounds a little more bragging than I want to be, but what people did end up saying was, we don't agree with you on everything, but we believe that you're honest and, and we respect you for standing up for what you believe in. And most of the time, even though sometimes we think you're off the wall, most of the time, most of the time, we think you're on our side. And I get I, the political scientist in me, it just, it just this goes crazy when I see all this discussion about the center. And now what we have is a, we have uh, the President Clinton and we have the Gingrich people and the, cent the President Clinton in the center and the Gingrich folks, and that's the debate. And I say to myself, are these people who are writing these articles defining the center as the average position taken by Democrats and Republicans in the Congress? Go out and poll people in this country and ask them whether they think that the average position of Democrats and Republicans in the Congress represents them or represents the mainstream. And to me, um, the, 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 the mainstream is to sort of understand what are the compelling issues that, that, that connect to people's lives, and I think and I came off a campaign which makes you be out there with people. I think that what people are saying is we want reform. Today we weren't talking about that. We want reform. We want a lot of this big money out of politics because we want the government, at least more often than not, to be on our side. And being on our side means living wage jobs. It means decent health care. It means standing up for us against the oil companies and the insurance companies. It means protecting the environment and investing in our children so they can have educational opportunities. That's the center. That's the mainstream. That's the politics. That's what we should be doing. And that's how we win, in my not so humble opinion. Other than that, I don't feel strongly about it. <laughs> we'll keep shifting from side to side. Hi, uh, my name is Ben Kublin. I'm an activist. And I believe that most people in this hall agree with you. But agreeing is not enough. If the people in this hall would really get together and give a little of themselves financially, physically, emotionally, God, we could turn things around, believe it or not. It's always a small minority that affects the outcome of a good cause or a bad cause. And we could do it here with this people here, just here. Mind you, each person here can ignite others. And this is what it comes down to. We have, there's plenty of organizations in Massachusetts that we could get together that are working to try to make America a better place to live in. So let me say shalom to everybody. <laughs> Thank you. I think I think that um, Ben, uh, you, Ben, if it's okay for me to say this, um, I actually, I think what I think it was a wonderful statement because I think it, you know, it's interesting. I was, I try to 
try to teach a class every two weeks in Minnesota, and I was in an alternative school in St. Paul, and with some pretty, real tough kids, tremendous talent. I'd say about 95% of the kids at this school were African American, and they were talking about how everybody looks down on us and a bunch of other things. And I said, just because people look down on you doesn't mean you have to look down on yourself. I mean, clearly it starts with you, and then we move to community, and then we make things happen. And I feel like that statement that you made does have a lot to do with personally our own lives and how we connect to this. And I, I'm so pleased you said it, because I think too many people have lost their indignation and too many people don't want to do the organizing. I mean, in some ways, many of us, not you, but many of us have become kind of lazy about that. We haven't done the good grassroots organizing. The Christian Coalition has, and, and they deserve credit for what they've done. There, there is nothing written anywhere that says people uh, are not allowed to write letters to the editor, not allowed to do telephone trees, not allowed to go voter registration, not allowed to run for school board, not allowed to uh, uh, do turn out the vote, not allowed to have accountability sessions with people in office, not allowed to turn up the heat. They do, and some of us haven't. And I think you know we have to rediscover that, and, and, I, and, I, and I think we will. Tomorrow I get a chance to speak to a a coalition of New England citizen action organizations have done great work, very credible, very solid, not marginal, uh, you guys. They do very solid work around not just today. I wanted to talk about you know, race, gender, and poverty in America as part of an unfinished agenda. This is very important to me. It's my passion. I think as a senator I can make a difference. I'm honored to be here at the Kennedy School. I want to do some of what Bobby Kennedy did by way of traveling around the country and focusing on these issues. But as a matter of fact, I think a lot of these issues are converging issues between low-income people and middle-income people. And I would start with the focus on, on living wage jobs. Uh, I thought of this, and I apologize, because it's overly simplistic. It's overly, I'm going to say simplistic, but it's a sort of too, too, it doesn't do justice to the complexity of it all. And I thought about it while I was in the shower, so it's not particularly profound. But, <laughs> you know, if you think about it, it's sort of how you would construct a domestic. Sometimes we kind of harp on the complexity of it all to the point where that becomes the ultimate cop out, you know? We don't know what to do, except we do know the WIC program works. We don't know what to do, except we know that early childhood development makes all the difference in the world. We don't know what to do, but we know education is real important. Well, I could say to you today, if you want to have real welfare reform, focus on a good education and a good job. I could say to you that if you want to reduce poverty, focus on a good education and a good job. If you want to have a stable middle class, focus on a good education and a good job. If you want our country to do well in an international economy, focus on a good education and a good job. If you want to have a country where you've got men and women, women and men, who can think on their own two feet, and understand the world and the country and the communities they live in, and better yet, know how to make it a better world and a better country and better communities, focus on a good education and a good job. And the interesting thing is, if you want to reduce the violence, I'm not going to stand up here. I went through this debate with all these Willie Horton ads we had to deal with. They were outrageous. I'm still angry that our children and grandchildren had to look at this crap. But I'm not going to stand here today and tell you that I don't think when someone commits a monstrous crime, they shouldn't be held accountable. When three 16-year-olds, no matter what the circumstances of their lives are, beat up an 85-year-old woman and leave her for dead, I don't feel sorry for them. But I'll tell you one other thing, and you know this. Every single, I don't do any damage to the truth, every single judge and every single police chief and every single sheriff I've ever talked to in Minnesota at least, regardless of Republican, Democrat, liberal, conservative, tough law and order, you name it, they all say the same thing. Senator, we'll, can, we can build a million new prisons, and we'll fill them all up, and we'll never stop this cycle of violence until we invest in the health and skills and intellect and character of our children, focus on a good education and a good job. I mean, that becomes part of the foundation of a domestic politics, and that's not a minority politics. That's not an ultra-liberal's politics, though I don't shy away from the label liberal. That is very much a part of the mainstream of America. Good jobs, good wages, educational opportunities, and a good standard of living for our families. My name is Shana England, and I work here at the Kennedy School. And I agree with you that there's probably not a voter in the country who would say that they disagree with um, 
the statement that there needs to be less poverty and kids yeah. need to be better educated and all the things you said today, but they're also voting in people, except for yays like you, but they're vo voting in people, who, a more conservative Senate and a more conservative president, that all the programs that would work towards alleviating problems are completely an anathema from the directly poverty re re excuse me, resolving problems, uh, programs to things like family planning and midnight basketball and all of those things. Right. And so even though people agree with that, they're not voting that way. And so I'm wondering how you structure any kind of national debate or any kind of national discussion about those issues when people are not voting and are not acting in a way that would seem that they care about it. Well, it's a fair question. And again, I, I, I uh, t t believe it or not, I think you do this speech to me today and you're being here, it would have been hard to speak to two people. Um, is sort of, for me, a beginning of, of, of doing everything I can as a senator uh, to make sure that our country doesn't turn its gaze away from, from a matter, from a tough set of questions that I think are so important to, to who we are and, and what we have to do as a nation. Um, there, are, I don't know quite where to start, but let me just try a couple of things out on you. Is it Shane? Shane or Shanna? Shana. Shana. <laughs> um, number one, and this is almost too easy for me to say, and so I, I'll say it, but then I'll tr try and be clear that it's still easier said than done. I mean, look, we're still dealing with this hole in the electorate. I mean, we had a fifth, over a 51% hole in the electorate. I mean, and if you look at the hole in the electorate, um, it, 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 it was, it's, it, it wasn't a random distribution of the population. It disproportionately, people of color, low and moderate income, blue collar, uh, workers who, who stayed at home, okay? So, uh, and I think one of the reasons why is to the extent, and I don't have great answers about how to break out of the cycle, but to the extent that people don't hear people running for office or either party speaking directly to the concerns and circumstances of their lives, which are these economic issues, they're not terribly excited, okay? So one of the things we have to do is connect to that. Now that in turn, I think, gets, it gets connect, that in turn, I think, is connected to um, perhaps the most fundamental core issue. I noticed, Doris, that in the New York Times, you listed reform as being what you thought was the major question. I mean, I think one of the things that's going on is to the extent that people, at least in statewide races, by necessity, no self-righteous intended on my part, have to raise all this money because the campaigns have become capital intensive TV campaigns, and that's the focus, all right? That's the focus. That imperative to raise huge amounts of money from those people who have the capital to give you for capital intensive campaigns, I think has neutered the policy performance of the Democratic Party. After all, the reason I'm being harder on the Democratic Party is that Republicans have never claimed to be the party for working people, you know, unions, jobs at decent wages, right, affordable higher education, universal, we have. And so, you know, you have that problem to deal with as well. So my answer is sort of the conclusion of this talk. Um, uh, and, and that has to do with, hey, it doesn't stop, it doesn't start top down, it starts bottom up. I think some of the best reform efforts, Maine did it, are going to be passed state by state and it's going to be, we're a grassroots political culture. I think the organizations I'm meeting with tomorrow do a great job of really involving people at the community level and statewide level. We're just going to have to build our, we're going to have to build our organizations and build our politics. And it will happen. And it will happen. I mean, um, this sounds very corny, and I'm not talking down to you. This comes from years of teaching. I taught, you know, for 21 years, and I used to say to students two things. One, you'll be a lot more credible if you don't separate uh, the lives you live from the words you speak. So regardless of your viewpoint, I respect you if you're working for what you believe in, number one. And number two, uh, the, second, the second point that I made is that, um, you know, history is not independent of what we do. So, I mean, you know. It's kind of hard to make observations and predictions about this. I mean, what's going to happen is going to depend upon what we make happen in our country. We're lucky enough to live in the kind of country where, in fact, we have that right and responsibility. Yeah. Hi. My name is Nora Gordon. I'm a graduate student in economics. And I was hoping you could say a few words about the role of academic research in furthering the kind of oh, yeah. anti-poverty, good jobs, good, good education agenda. Nora? Yes. Um, 
you know, I feel like these answers, I'm going to shorten the answers. I feel like I've, you know, people are, you all are smiling and saying, he must be good at filibusters. Uh, you know, uh, the, the, uh, I love your question as opposed to the other questions. No, I, I mean, I love it. Uh, the, uh, I was, well, Mary Jo and David and Elwin, we were talking earlier about some of the work that people are going to be doing here, focusing on this question about the economy. I mean, this whole question of how it is, this, because I think this is the future. I mean, this is how, how can we have, how do we have an economy that produces enough jobs that people can count on? And a job you can count on is a job with a decent wage with decent benefit. I think this, is, this whole issue of living wage jobs is key. And so I think there's a real role for real good research. I think what happens, if it's okay for me to say this, is that all too often, um, two, two thing, either one or two things happen. Number one, um, there increasingly a lot of the research, well, number one, it quite often has not been the sort of research focus of the, of, of the mainstream of some of the professions, economics profession included, and I, I'd like to see more of a focus on it. These are, I think, compelling issues for our country and good economic work by economists is extremely important. But I don't think there has been nearly as much attention paid. And in fact, the issues more that I'm talking about are the economic issues. So number one, it's a matter of really beginning to focus more on it again. Um, and we should and we must. And then the second uh, point I want to make is um, all too often really good work then kind of works its way into journals, but then doesn't but that doesn't translate into much. We also have to figure out how to make the academic research become uh, vital and part of the public policy debate. And, and quite often we don't do that. And quite often there's very little correlation between what we publish in our professional journals and the betterment of the lives of the very people that we've studied or talked about. We have to figure out how to make that clear connection. And then the third point, which is now I'm really dreaming, but the third point I would make is um, if, in fact, we did more of the citizen action work that we were talking about, I think it's great when, when you and others with the skills that you have are able to do some of the kind of research that can become essentially, that can essentially provide those people who are most affected by this or trying to living with it with some, some of the data and information that they need, taking it down to a more community level if you follow what I'm saying. I actually did, uh, this now is getting to be a longer answer, I'm sorry. I actually got into big trouble at Carleton for doing this. <laughs> uh, I mean, I love the school and uh, everything is fine and this was many years ago, but I, just a quick, quick story. I did this research with uh, independent uh, study with uh, 60 or 70 students in three different groups, all in Rice County, all dealing with poverty issues. And the big, not using names, the big, there were many confrontations, but one of them was, uh, a number of different people said to me, well, uh, we would think that this research, now that you've completed it, would be the basis for appearing before the commissioners and so on as county commissioners and making rec policy recommendations. And I said it wasn't done for them. We gave this all to this poor people's organization. It was done for them. And it's like, I didn't go far on that. Um, but, I mean, if you see what I'm saying, that, there's that kind of thing that can be done as well. Hi, my name is Jeannie Lang, and I'm an undergraduate at the college. And several new studies have come out saying that um, the benefits that um, the, the benefits accrued by students who have been in the Head Start program are kind of diffused once they get into the general mix of students um, in the schools. To what degree do you think a sense of maybe futility, um, unless the program is immediately and vastly expanded um, on the part of politicians, has led to kind of a paltry showing by the Democrats in support of Head Start? To what, uh, and what kind of credibility would you assign these studies? And if you think that they're true, um, how do you think we can change these effects? Well, I think, um I'm not going to sort of say that people who, and, and I don't know all of the research, I, I think there's, you might be able to help, you, you might be able to help, rather than my being glib, maybe you can comment okay. directly. But can I make a point, point B? Mary Jo will help me with point A. Point B is, um, it is, even if the research suggests 
and there probably is sort of some ambiguity about the results and not consensus on this. But even if the research was to suggest that whereas Head Start really does work for children, but then the benefits slowly dissipate, fade away as kids go through the public education system, that would suggest not that we therefore kind of harmonize everything down, <laughs> but rather, uh, and I talked about this, that we really, and I will emphasize, focus on public education in America and what we need to do to make sure that as a matter of fact, this is another part that I could have developed in this speech today, that as a matter of fact, um, all of our children, all of our children have these educational opportunities. I could recite for you, but you already know it, the work of many people. I think Jonathan Kozel is the best at denunciation. If any of you have read his his latest book is his latest book is Amazing Grace, Poor Children in the Conscience of America. And if I had to summarize the book, and he's not wrong, and the book that he wrote before that was Savage Inequality, Public Education in America. And if I had to summarize Jonathan Kozel's latest book, it is simply this, looking at the Mott Haven community in Bedford-Stuyvesant, I think in New York City. In the Bronx. Bronx. Jonathan Kozel says, uh, any country that truly loved children would never let children grow up under these conditions. It's that simple. So, I mean, it's a, you know, it's a fuller agenda. I alluded to it, and I think, now, by the way, a book that's a little better on the Annunciation, right? Because I worry sometimes that after you read Kozel, you're devastated. It, uh, is Mike Rose's book called Possible Lives. Wonderful work, so is Jonathan Kozel's, which deals with all sorts of successful models because ultimately it's all about what happens in that classroom between the teacher and the student. And by the way, I think the real issue, of course, is what also doesn't happen outside the classroom. You know, So I mean, I think the focus should be on public education, big time. Thank you. That could be a whole other, and I'm sorry I'm cutting that short. I'm, I'm actually hoping to give the best speech I can, at least within my ability, I can give to the Minnesota State Legislature in two weeks just on education, trying to sort of develop some of what you're suggesting has to be. You want to deal with part A? <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I'd just give two answers to that question. Uh, in, in terms of the research itself on, on Head Start, there are some mixed results. I think there are some very promising results from long-term studies of programs like Head Start. The other thing I always say, though, to people when they raise this question is, suppose you asked a middle-class family who was sending their child to nursery school and thought it was really important, if they really believed that by sending their child to nursery school and then putting them in the worst possible schools after that, that their having gone to nursery school for that year would make a difference in uh, you know, whether they grew up to, to good and successful lives. And people would say, what are you, nuts? Uh, of course they have to not only be in a good preschool, they have to be in a good elementary school, in a good middle school, in a good high school. So I think that to the extent that we do have some evidence, and it's true, uh, that Head Start doesn't immunize you from bad schools for the rest of your lives, that's a call to improve the rest of schooling, not a call to, to, to uh, uh, defeat funding for Head Start. Sorry. sorry no, sorry. That's, that's said a lot better than I could. Only take I'm going to take one more. I, can I also just, the, there's one other thing, two, two other, 10 other, 20 other things I want, two other things. Because I, I love your, the question is so near and dear to, wish, to my I heart. I wish we could hear your speech to the legislature. What? <laughs> I wish we could hear your speech to the legislature. Too. Oh, thank you, thank you. But what I was gonna, but what I was gonna say to you is, first name again? Jeannie. Jeannie. You know, there are two, just final things. There are two things, Sasha, I think this is true. There are two things I said over and over again during the campaign that I think worked really well. They were honest and sincere, and that's the best way to do it. One, with a twinkle in my eye, I railed, and I said, the tobacco companies and the pharmaceutical companies and the big insurance companies, they don't like me, but they already have great representation in Washington. <laughs> it's the rest of the people that need it, and I'm a senator for children. No, I, well, thanks, but, but see, it works, but we agree. I'm a senator for children and education and working families. The other thing, which is different, that goes also to your question, is because I, you know, you sort of, everybody in this room, can, you can ask yourself, what informs you? What kind of, what, what is the basis of your, what has shaped your viewpoint? What, do you, what is the core value or belief around which you construct so many of the positions you take on issues? And I, I really mean this. 
I've decided, without using any label, that since you learn every day, I believe that as a teacher. I don't think we should talk K through 12. It's crazy. I mean, we all have talked about preschool. We should talk preschool and K through 85, right? And by the way, or, or more. And by the way, given the economy, and what's, that's, that's part of what we do need to do. But to me, it's this, especially with these grandchildren, because so much of what we know is personal. I, I, can, I can hold our youngest grandchild like this, and I can look at him, or I can look at her, and I just simply say to myself that I believe that every child, no matter whose child it is, because they're all God's children, that every child, every child ought to have the same opportunity to reach his or her full potential. And any set of public policies and any set of private sector policies that help us come closer to reaching that goal, which I think represents the very essence of the American dream, I'm for. And any set of policies that make it more difficult, that take us away down a different path, I resist with everything I have. And you're speaking to that question, really. My name is James Williamson, and I study here, and I live here in Cambridge. And I, uh, I personally believe, as I think a lot of people do, that political reform, even revolution, is central to all of the things that you're talking about. But I would like to ask you to speak to, to two particular issues of the many that you could speak uh, about that I think are, are extremely important that you haven't touched on. And the first is military spending. Uh -huh. When military spending uh, is, is raised, the, the uh, Secretary of Defense uh, who spoke here not too long ago said, well, we've cut it drastically. Yeah. Now, I'd like you to, to say, first of all, whether you believe that's true, yeah. and second of all, how we can uh, take on the issue of military spending. Uh, it's, it's never, it seems to be never allowed to be on the table when the conversation right. about budget, uh, budgetary matters right. comes up. And this leads to the second issue, which is in order to turn back the, the tide uh, of, you know, this past season, it was what they defined, welfare as they defined it, not corporate welfare, but right. welfare as they defined it. And now it's going to be Social Security as they define it and the privatization of it. Right. Now, in order to turn back that momentum, I think we have to take on the uh, control of the media in this country, corporate media, that limits our ability to mobilize uh, ourselves politically to achieve the kinds of goals that I think many of us here share. Well, let me do it real quickly, and we have just, and then we'll finish up with one final question. Uh, I appreciate very much your, 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 or is that, were you there for a question or not? I, I'm willing to quit if you would. No, no, I want, you'll be the last question. Uh, I think, James, that um, I very much appreciate your, 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 your uh, sort of putting onto the agenda of our discussion here that Pentagon spending should be part of the equation of deficit reduction. And no, I do not agree that, 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 um, I mean, I think it's a matter of whether we go forward with fighting two wars at the same time strategy. Um, I think there, uh, I think that uh, Lawrence Kolb and others have done very good work at Brookings Institute who have suggested, Under Secretary of Defense with Reagan, suggesting that we should be cutting the Pentagon budget by much more significant amount. I mean, you're up against political power, but I think that very much should be part of the equation. And you know, this also gets into the definition of real national security. I wouldn't say real national security is yet more stealth bombers. I'd say real national security is security of our local communities, and that would include jobs and education and all the rest. On the media, I have a different analysis. I don't know, I, I guess I don't talk, think about revolution, and I don't know what it means to sort of take over the media. I think that, um, I think by and large, um, we can count on respectful coverage um, if in fact we have, if we do a good job in terms of what credible, workable policy proposals if we organize behind them, and um, if, in fact, we, you know, are determined to, to, to push hard for what we believe in. I'm going to do that as a senator. I do think, however, that, and I always appreciate it when, and when media focuses on these issues, I do think, however, that a lot of the kind of discussion needs to take place at a more community level, and on that I'm in complete agreement with you. It's always been that way. It's always been that way. Okay. Thank you for Last including me. Last question. Your Thank name you is? for including me. 
I'm George Fisher, a retired you, physicist. Plenty of time to think now. And I acutely hope you are going to win and succeed. And my concern is your strategy. And you said you're going to do, do a lot of things in the Senate, introducing bills and fighting hard and speaking a lot. But I wonder whether you have a larger strategy than that. For instance, I'll just cite three examples. One is, if I wanted to win a battle as huge as yours, I would get as many friends as I could, gather up allies. I would love to hear you say you're, you're getting a huge army behind you. The second thing is, as I see the world, I see that a lot of our economy is what some people call going global. Yeah. And to fight a lot of our problems, we have to consider that we can't necessarily fight within the United States alone. The same problems are happening in Germany. Yeah. They have strong unions, but the unions are losing because of huge unemployment as a strategy. And you see in Korea, the Koreans decided that they're going to change all the laws about how unions can work. So it's an international problem. Yes. And again, the strategy that I would talk about if I was you or your helper is you've got to gather up not just nationally but internationally and say, what are we going to do about this? Because all our soft jobs have been sent overseas. Yeah. And the third thing is I don't think anybody can win unless you do something about campaign finances. Campaign finances must be fixed before you can hope to win. Yeah. And so I'm wondering, do you have a secret larger strategy? Um, <laughs> well, I actually have one right here in this folder. Uh, strategy okay. that I now I'll want to how we change the world and then change. I, I, think, I think your question is, I, I mean, I love your question. I, I won't do it justice. Real quickly, on money and politics and reform, yes, it's a core issue. You know, the only thing that worries me is, however, if, if it doesn't, if we don't really, if nothing changes much for the better, that doesn't mean that we therefore sit on our thumbs and say, well, it was the core issue, therefore there's nothing else we can do. But you're right, and I have a strategy on that one, okay? Can I give you the strategy? Fine, fine. Can you hear fine. me? My strategy is uh, twofold, but, I, but I'll just give you the onefold part of it, um, <laughs> which is uh, I, I, I uh, am absolutely convinced. I've tr I have been talking to a lot of people. I hope it will happen. I can't, or I can't like will it into existence, but I'm absolutely convinced that, by golly, if this compromise um, gets made in Washington right now, again, based on the average position <laughs> or whatever of people in the Congress, it, it, it is going to be a pretty kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It'll be pretty, there'll be an accommodation here, an accommodation there, it'll be very jerry-rigged, people won't understand it, and people will say this is going to do anything. I think we need to have something very comparable, remember Earth Day, I think we need to have a reform day, I think within the next month, month and a half, um, all around the country on the same day there need to be accountability sessions in every state where people turn up the heat and meet directly with everybody in the Congress and say we want action. People won't be experts at all the ins and outs of the different bills, but they're experts uh, talking about what they hate about this system and then what they want changed. We have to turn up the heat all around the country, back in the states. DC is too expensive an airplane trip away for people from Massachusetts and Minnesota, but all of us come home, all of us should be accountable, and that's the way to do it, okay? On the global part, um, Bill Greider apparently just wrote a great book that I haven't read. I did read a book that I think is on the mark by Bartlett and Steele, two journalists with the Philadelphia Inquirer, the title of the book is Who Stole the American Dream. They've been getting some rough reviews because a lot of reviewers don't like their analysis and trade policy. But I think they're right in saying, you know, we've, we're really in an international economy, okay. We need to look at that. We need to look at trade policy. And we need to look at what effect it's going to have on wage earners. And is there not a way that we can have trade agreements that lift the living standards of people as opposed to depress those living standards. And by the way, the title of that book, I think I mentioned it, is very much a part of a majority politics. Who stole the American dream? What happened to the sort of promise of America three decades after World War II that we'd have an expanding middle class? And by golly, if you worked hard, you had a real good chance to be a part of it or your children did. Where did that go? And how do we get back to that? That, I think, is going to be the kind of majority politics. And as far as the strategy, and I'm done, three components that I'm doing, going real quickly for whatever it's worth, and I'm not doing justice to your question, three components. A, and no particular order of importance. You have to have 
and I'm here at the Kennedy School. I mean, it's it's the right thing for you know me to say here. Um, you have to have the intellectual policy part is important. Credible, workable alternatives. The work that needs to be done on some of the tough questions. And I don't mean that as a cliche or as an academic cop out. We have not focused on what does it really mean to talk about an economy that in fact generates living wage jobs. That is key. But if all you do is the intellectual work, sorry to say this, um, uh, proposing correct solutions to the problem, Mary Jo and David Elwood both know this all too well, proposing correct solutions to the problem doesn't ipso facto put into gear the machinery to deal with those problems. And the missing ingredient there is the constituency to fight for those changes. So there has to be grassroots organizing, which has to be more locally based. It's not just based on work in Washington. And number three, electoral politics, because those people who sort of swear off electoral politics or eschew it marginalize themselves because that's one of the major ways we can test for power. Now I put them all together. If you have the policy work without the grassroots organizing, uh, you have a program, but you have nobody to fight for it. If you have the grassroots organizing without the policy work, then you have a movement with no head or no direction. And you can't just be full of denunciation. People are also interested in what will work. And if you have an electoral politics without the grassroots organizing, I'm sorry to say this because I don't want it to be this way, it's a politics without a base where we call on people every two years or four years to put bumper stickers on cars and call people, but in the, but in the two years or four years that go by, they're not involved in the community in a deep way. So all three things, all three pieces is a part of a, a strategy, and I think we have to work on it. And I am absolutely convinced I'm the optimist that uh, this is a wonderful and great country, and we can move this country forward on an agenda of justice. And that includes, as a part of that agenda, turning our gaze not away from these issues of race and gender and poverty, but making a commitment to opportunities for all of our citizens. Thank you very much, everybody. I just want to express everybody's appreciation to the senator for being with us. It was a real honor, and I think he can count on us to help in the fight. Thanks for having me. It means a lot to me that you had me. Good.